I think we're about ready to begin. So we'll everyone find a place to sit. I would like to welcome everyone this morning to our Reformation lectures. Uh, we're looking forward to some very interesting and uh, enlightening uh, lectures about the Reformation era. This is the 49th, as you can see on your uh, brochure, the 49th annual B.W. Teigen Reformation Lecture Series. And notice, if you look on the back side, the very, our very first uh, speaker was in 1965, and that was Dr. Hermann Zassi. The purpose of these lectures is to um, uh, create an interest and uh, uh, give more knowledge concerning uh, the Lutheran Reformation. As, uh, as we probably all know, the center of that Reformation was the restoration of the central article of the faith, uh, justification by faith alone, uh, that we are justified or declared righteous by nothing that we do, but alone on the basis of Christ's redemptive work, which is ours by faith in the Savior, by trusting in him. And even that faith is worked uh, through uh, the means of grace which bring us the treasures of salvation. This year, the theme of the, of the lectures is the cost of confessing Luther and the three princes. The lectures will explore the life and work of the three rulers during Luther's lifetime in Ernstine Saxony. God, through these men, created the environment and the political situation that made it possible uh, for the restoration of the gospel. Uh, these men defended and protected the Reformation movement in its infancy great Lutheran confessors they were to a man. Our three lecturers uh, for this series are, first of all, Dr. Roland Ziegler, and then Dr. Charles Cartwright, and Dr. David Lump. There will be, the three essays will eventually be uh, recorded in the Lutheran Quarterly. Uh, Dr. Ziegler, our first speaker, uh, will his lecture will be, be Luther and Frederick the Wise. Dr. Ziegler uh, joined the faculty of Concordia uh, Theological Seminary Fort Wayne in 2000. He serves as the Robert Preuss Associate Professor of Systematic Theology and Confessional Lutheran Studies. Born in the state of Baden-Württemberg, Germany, he studied at the universities of Tübingen and Erlangen. He received his master's from the Lutheran Theological Seminary Oberuzel. A scholarship enabled him uh, to study as an exchange student at Concordia. He received his doc doctorate uh, from the Eberhard Karls Universität Tübingen in 2011. Dr. Ziegler serves as a, as served, past tense, as a teaching assistant at the Oberusel Seminary, a vicar in Berlin, and a pastor in Constance. He has served, he has been serving on the Commission of Theology and Church Relations of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, since 2010 and has been involved in conversations between the International Lutheran Council and the uh, Pontifical Council for the Promotion of Church Union since 2015. He is co-editor of the Hermann Zasse in Statu Confessionis Part 3 and author of Das Eucharisti Gebet in Theologie and Liturgie Der Lutherischen Kirchenzeit der Reformation, uh, 
die Bedeutung des Herrenmahles zwischen Parmesio und Eucharistie. He is on the uh, editorial advisor board of the, Asac of the Asacopedia of Martin Luther and the Reformation. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, lectures will be organized in this way. There will be one lecture this morning, one this afternoon at 2, and then one tomorrow morning with a summation tomorrow afternoon at 2. We urge everyone in the discussion times to feel free to speak. Uh, as is always the case, uh, our uh, format is that of a free conference. This is outside the framework of fellowship. Um, one last thing that I want to say, and that is for those of you that believe in the inspired 41 hymnal, <laughs> it's my fault that I picked the wrong words this morning. Melody was fantastic, organist was great, but those of us that were born and raised on the other one, it breaks our heart. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that, we would like to uh, welcome Dr. Ziegler. Thank you very much, President Schmeling, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, thank you, Dr. Schmeling, for the invitation. Uh, it's the first time I've ever been in Mankato, so uh, it was a nice drive from uh, Fort Wayne. I also bring you greetings from Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne, and from President Rast, who fondly remembers his time here at the Reformation Lectures. Uh, I probably should start with a disclaimer. Um, when I was asked to present here, I said, I'm a systematician, I'm not a historian. And Dr. Schwiering said, that's fine. So I come to you not as a professional uh, historian. And uh, I was uh, walking around here this morning a little bit. I, I remember that, of course, uh, since I'm on the Robert Preuss chair. Robert Preuss, of course, has his connections with Bethany. He was the first graduate or in the first graduate, first graduate of the seminary. And I understand you also have some of his books in the library, right? for which I'm envious, uh, but uh, I hope you use them well. <laughs> so I'm supposed to speak on Luther and Frederick the Wise. So Luther started out as an obscure monk, continued to be a locally known professor, and became a world historical figure. From a political non-entity, he became a politically highly significant person, even though he never shaped history in a political process or as a, uh, himself. Unlike some professors and pastors in later times, he did not exchange the pulpit and classroom with the corridors of power. But the Reformation was, as we all know, not only a theological phenomenon, it was also a political movement. And of course, the person most directly affected was Luther's prince, Frederick the Wise. If Frederick the Wise would have simply obeyed the demands of the Roman Curia, the Reformation, as we know it, would have never happened, and Luther probably would have died an early death as a heretic on a stake in Rome. Humanly speaking, without Frederick the Wise, there would have been no Lutheran Reformation. Maybe you remember the last film on Luther with Joseph Fiennes as Luther. There, Peter Ustinov gave one of his last performances as Frederick the Wise, nicely portraying the tactics of stall and delay of the historical Frederick the Wise. The film, of course, is an artistic depiction of Luther, so it took certain historical licenses. Among them, it shows a personal meeting between Frederick the Wise and Luther, where Luther gives to him the, uh, the September Testament. Uh, that, uh, as we know, never happened. For Frederick confessed that he saw Luther only once at the Diet of Worms in 1521. That might sound strange to us, that these two that lived not only in close vicinity to each other, but also many times, of course, at, in the same town, a small town, Wittenberg at that time had probably 5,000 people, never ever met. But 16th century Wittenberg is a different time than ours. 
Frederick was no politician who shook hands, rubbed elbows, and worked the room. Of course, he didn't need to be elected. He was elector by birth. He was a prince and an elector, and the social distance between him and Luther was so wide that no accidental meeting would have ever occurred. Still, it remains curious that never, Frederick never gave his famous professor an audience. Wasn't he curious of actually meeting Luther, having a talk with him? What about other contexts? We know that Frederick the Wise wrote four times to Luther, and 37 letters by Luther to Frederick are extant. Not much for the 12 years, if you count uh, from the beginning of the lectures in 1513, 13 if you count his doctorate in, in 1512. So not much of contact there. The pic picture changes, though, if one takes into account the letters between Spalatin, the personal secretary of Frederick the Wise, and Luther, numbering altogether 304 letters while Frederick was alive. Thus, Frederick the Wise certainly was well informed and kept a close contact with Luther, though indirectly, and that was mostly for tactical reasons. Frederick avoided direct contact so that he could truthfully say against the pressure by, em by the emperor, his fellow princes, and the papal court that he had no personal contacts with Luther. That again was part of his stall and delay tactic. And even if this seems to be a rather obvious maneuver, it helped Frederick to avoid open confrontation. It is quite interesting that Luther, not known for stealth dissimulation or evasive tactics in his own life, saw his prince in this positively. And I do not doubt that the prince will be unharmed in the future as long as he does not publicly confess my cause or approve of it. What kind of relationship did they have? I have some longer quotes here. This is actually in the text. This is the first letter that we know of written by Luther to his prince. So he starts out to my gross, most gracious and dear Lord, Duke Frederick, Elector of Saxony, to his grace personal. Starts out with Jesus. And then, most gracious Lord and sovereign, since your grace promised me a new cowl a year ago, as Hirschfeld told me, I now come and ask your grace to remember this promise. I beg, however, gracious Lord, if Pfeffinger is again to make the arrangements that he do so now indeed, and not just with a friendly promise. He's very good at spinning fine words, but these do not produce good cloth. <laughs> you have to remember, of course, that Luther had no money of his own. He was a monk. That is, he relied on others to provide for him, and the prospect of a new cowl was not uh, something to be neglected. He needed it. And obviously, as you see here, as, as in other cases too, it's one thing that princes promises something, it's another thing that princes actually follow through with it. So Luther was not shy about reminding, with all deference, but still reminding Frederick that there was this outstanding promise, and of course, Frederick himself doesn't take care of it, he has his underlings, and that his underlings might be less than diligent in carrying out this uh, this promise. Most gracious Lord, I have been told by the prior effort who had learned it from your grace's father confessor that your grace is annoyed by Dr. Staupitz, our esteemed and dear father, because of a certain letter. Therefore, when Dr. Staupitz was here and saw your grace at Torgau, I talked to his honor and declared that I would not like to see your grace's displeasure come upon his honor. Truthfully, from the long conversation which we discussed your grace all evening, I found out nothing else than that he has your grace in his inmost heart that the elector of Saxony is his dear sovereign, and that he is more than well disposed toward your grace. This was so much the case that he finally stated, I do not know how I ever, ever provoked my most gracious lord, unless it be that I held his grace in too high a regard. Therefore, most gracious lord, I plead on his behalf, as he has suggested to me several times, that your grace continue to favor and to be loyal to him, just as your grace has undoubtedly experienced his loyalty many times. What we see here is that Luther, on this place and, and in others, he was sought as an intercessor. Because even though they never had met, nevertheless, Frederick had a very high view of Luther. He was one of his favorite professors, and he was his, one of his favorite professors because he was a magnet for students at that time, and Frederick had a very um, uh, close interest in the university. So if one of your best professors asks something, you might be more inclined than 
a professor whom you regard as, well, a little bit of a failure. Let's put it this way. Most gracious Lord, that I too may show my faithfulness toward your grace and may earn my courtly cowl, let me add the following. I have heard that your grace plans at the end of this tax period to impose another and perhaps even heavier tax. If your grace will not scorn the plea of a poor beggar, I beg that for the sake of God you will not let it come to that. I and many others who mean well with your grace are sincerely sorry that even the last taxation has reduced your grace's reputation, name, and goodwill. Of course, God has provided your grace with so much intelligence that sees further in such things that I, or maybe all of your grace's subjects, but I may well be indeed God wills it so that even great wisdom sometimes be guided by the lesser so that no one may depend upon himself, but only upon God our Lord. May he preserve your grace and good health for our benefit, and thereafter your grace's soul to salvation. Amen. Your grace's dedicated priest, Dr. Martin Luther, or Luther at that time, at Wittenberg. So here we see that Luther did not shy away from actually giving political advice, which again you might say, come on, you're a professor of theology. What do you know about budgets, taxation, and the economy? But Luther is here asking the, the prince, in all deference, but nevertheless, he is asking the prince to reconsider a decision about taxation, guided by the, by the desire that the prince will be loved by his subjects. And as we all know, higher taxes don't increase the love of the subjects to their prince. So you see him here with all deference, nevertheless, standing there before Frederick and asking for, for this promise, interceding for a friend, and also giving political advice. So who was this Frederick the Wise? Frederick the Wise was a member of the House of Wettin, whose ancestral castle is a fort at the River Saale, about 14 miles north of Halle. The House of Wettin had inherited in 1423 the Duchy of Saxony, after the Ascanians uh, had died out, and with it, the electorate. And I assume that you're kind of familiar with the constitution of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, the emperor was not, uh, came not into, into his office by inheritance, but uh, since Charles IV and the Golden Bull, you had seven electors, the seven highest princes. They would elect the prince. Now, for a long time, uh, they elected the same person from the same family. Uh, from the end of the empire from the late 15th century till actually the end of the empire in uh, 1806. Only one time somebody else was elected. Um, <clears throat> but the elector was at the top tier. Just as the Holy Roman Empire was not a nation state but combined different peoples, though the heartland was German speaking, so also Frederick, if one looks at his ancestry, was a European prince. His ancestors were of the German nobility, but also from the Polish royal family, the Visconti and Scala in Italy, and others. His grandfather, Friedrich II, or Frederick II, the, the, the Sanftmütige, uh, how do you translate it into English? The, uh, meek. the meek, yes, the meek, had two sons, Ernst or Ernest and Albrecht. Albrecht had three surviving sons, George the Bearded, you all know him. Uh, he was one of the uh, feed, uh, enemies of Luther. Uh, Henry the Pious, who succeeded him, and Frederick, the high master of the Teutonic Knights uh, in uh, East Prussia, what is now um, Poland and uh, Russia. Ernst died August 26, 1486, in Kolditz because he fell off a horse during a hunt. I suppose that's a professional accident. His mother, Elizabeth of the House of Wittelsbach, had died a year er earlier. Uh, Frederick had an older sister, Christine, who married the Danish king, John II. Their son was Christian II, who later played a role in the history of the Reformation as an exile in Wittenberg and actually ended his life as a long-term prisoner. So for all you Danes, well, Danes Norwegians, right? There's this family history too, because he was, of course, also ruling over Norway. Um, Frederick, born January 17th, 1463, had two younger brothers, another Ernst, who became the administrator of the Archdiocese of Magdeburg in, in 1476, age 12, that's for a career, in 1489, Archbishop of Magdeburg. In 1479, he was the co adjutor of the Diocese of Halberstadt, and 1480, its administrator. In Ernst, you see the successful princely policy to get younger sons of ruling houses elected as bishops of neighboring dioceses 
and thus bring them under control of the family, including, of course, also the fact that several bishoprics could be combined by one person. This phenomenon is known to all of us, of course, through the successor of Archbishop Ernst, Archbishop Albrecht of Mainz, Magdeburg, and, the, and also Bishop of Halberstadt. You see also that, of course, in Albrecht, the house of Hohenzollern, north of Saxony, had beaten the house of Wettin to the trough. This happened also concerning the next brother of Frederick, Albrecht, uh, administrator in, in 1480, then in 1482, Archbishop of Mainz. Um, the youngest brother, Johann, later known as John the Constant, or Steadfast, born in 1468, died in 1532, will be the subject of the next lecture. He succeeded his brother and became the ancestor of the branches of the continuing Ernestine line of Wettin. So Frederick never married. There were all kinds of marriage proposals and projects, but he had a concubine. Uh, that was kind of a kind of, a kind of common law marriage whose name we don't even know. It's a little bit like Augustine and his concubine. We don't know his, her name either, right? And had at last two sons, Frederick and Sebastian. <coughs> uh, that was not seen as, a concubine is not a mistress. <coughs> so a concubine was a marriage by, of a lesser degree, so to speak, which meant that the wife <coughs> and the children of such a uh, union did not have the rights of a uh, of, of regular wives. They couldn't inherit, for example. Um, but it wasn't, again, it was not a, uh, just shaking up. Uh, concubinage was forbidden by church only in 1511. About Frederick's youth and education, not much is known. He did learn writing, reading, and arithmetic. He also learned Latin in such a way that he understood it well, even if he did not like to speak it. Frederick was also fluent in French. He participated in the pastime of jousting and was an avid hunter. Spalatin, who wrote the first biography of Frederick the Wise, tells the story that when he went to the place to joust for the first time, a woman cried out, who let that kid on the place? That actually nagged him for the rest of his life. <laughs> um, from the, his later years, we know that one of his pastimes was wood turning a quite popular hobby, hobby at that time. Even the Emperor Maximilian did it, and by the way, Luther also tried his hand, so I suppose it's some, some kind of soothing effect when you stand there and turn wood. What about his public life? Well, in 1485, Saxony was divided among the two brothers, Ernst and Albrecht, in the so-called Leipzig division. Ernst and Albrecht had ruled together for 20 years, but then decided to part ways. Why did they do it? The short answer is, we do not know. But Saxony, which was the second largest principality in the empire, now was cut in twain into two territories that were not continuous and with many legal questions between the two not resolved in the treaty and thus bearing the potential for conflict. The Ernestine territory comprised the electoral circuit, that is the area around Wittenberg, and the Thuringian territories. The Albertine territory comprised Leipzig with its university and also the Ore Mountains. Uh, the wealth of Saxony at that time was in the Ore Mountains because there you had mines uh, that mined silver. Now, the silver mines were uh, administered jointly, and as you can also imagine, that's really not the greatest arrangement either. As an elector, Frederick was one of the seven highest princes of the realm. He was for a while quite close to the Emperor Maximilian, so much that at the reform of the empire in 1500, he was appointed locum tenens of the emperor in the imperial government, though this was a post that did not mean much because the reform efforts concerning the government of the empire did not amount to anything. This was a recurring thing in the late 15th, early 16th century, there was the effort to have some kind of a continual government to strengthen the power of the emperor. As you can imagine, uh, the princes were not all too eager to actually have a powerful central government. And uh, so, um, as they would later say, they wanted to retain their Deutsche Libertät, their German freedom. Um, <clears throat> after the death of Maximilian, he actually could have become emperor. Frederick was also the favorite candidate of England, Venice, and the Pope. And that, of course, has influence on the history of the Reformation 
because one of the reasons why the process against Luther was not um, pursued with all the might of the Pope was that the Pope was hoping to uh, get Frederick elected and thus avoid Charles to be elected, who uh, was a little bit too powerful for the Pope. Uh, but Frederick declined because of his age and the lack of resources necessary for this office. What about his religious opinions? Frederick was a pious prince. As far as we know, he attended mass every day, even when he was in the Lochau, in his hunting castle. He spent significant money on sacred vessels and vestments, and he seemed to be especially close to the Franciscans. We know that he had a Latin lectionary with the readings for mass as a devotional. With that went, as what not, not, was what not unusual at the time, also a belief in astrology. Of course, we all know that uh, Melanchthon also was uh, very much into astrology. Luther, not so much. <laughs> Actually, he didn't think anything of it. But of course, Frederick is famous for his collection of relics. At the eve of the Reformation, Frederick had collected 19,331 relics, whose veneration gained one indulgences of 1,902,209 years and 270 days. Frederick's collection increased around the time of the foundation of the university. He had started actually after he made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Um, and there you have a nice example of how religion, commerce, and uh, maybe also education go together. The money that was paid for the indulgences went to the Collegiate Church, uh, to many of you known as the Castle Church, and many of the canons that served at the Collegiate ch Church were also professors at the university. Thus, the indulgences were indirectly funding the university. Scholarship has long been divided on the question if he stayed a Reformed Catholic or if he embraced Luther's Reformation. Uh, the evidence is kind of skimpy a little bit. We know that he, st uh, that he stopped buying relics after 1519, so that would speak that uh, Frederick actually embraced Luther's critique. It's also at least significant that in 1522, uh, when the new uniforms of the court, all the courtiers wore uniforms they get in the spring they got a dress and in the fall they got a new dress. In 1522, he had put on the sleeves of the uniform of the employees of his court VDMIEA, Verbum Domini Manet in Aeternum, one of the slogans of the Reformation, which he also, by the way, put on coins. Finally, uh, on his deathbed, Frederick did receive communion under both kinds. It's kind of like a Constantine the Great moment, uh, maybe. Uh, more concerning his religious opinions will become clear in this paper. What about his character? Of course, he's called the wise. One of his favorite sayings was, one should not easily say yes, but what one promises, one ought to keep. He was very cautious, he also loved peace, and he was very deliberate. When a document was presented to him by his counselors, he could send it back 20 times before he actually signed it with his remarks. He was also rather reticent and not at all a vain man. Thus, when some princes and counts sang for him at the Diet of Worms, he wrote to his brother, but I have pretended not to hear it, for dear God, it is not my custom to engage in society. Another one of his favorite sayings was, nothing lies, and it's to, to lie, do not speak the truth, lies on earth as much as man. He had no tolerance for dishonesty, but he was not some misanthropic crank. He was scru scrupulously honest with money, and expected his civil servants to be honest too. Uh, that is also shown, for example, that he made restitution for damage by a hunt. Hunting, of course, was the favorite pastime of the time, and when you, when you hunt, you, you go over the fields, the farmers might suffer from that, and Frederick did not just write that off as well. That's just what happens, but he actually paid them. What about the university? The university was founded in 1502 at the day of uh, the uh, evangelist Luke, October 18th. Uh, that was the foundation day. Um, why, did Luther why did Frederick found it? After the partition of Saxony, the University of Saxony, that, that was in Leipzig, was in the ducal part, so of the Albertine line. George had that. 
And so Frederick was left without a university. A university was not only a prestige object, that it was too, there were also obviously economic advantages. The state, which in the process of modernization increased its administration, needed especially legally trained civil servants. Students, therefore, would stay, if there was a university in, in, in the country, would stay yeah, and, uh, in the state, and money would not flow to other sta states. Plus, of course, there would be no brain drain. A university would also foster the economy of the town in which it was. Universities were, though, not simply the business of the local prince, you, princes. You can't simply hang out your shingle and say, here is a university. Rather, the custom was first to get the agreement of the pope, then the emperor. Uh, in the case of Wittenberg, it actually worked the other way around. Frederick received the imperial diploma on July 2nd, 1502, and published a decree about the opening of the university with his brother John on August 24th, at St. Bartholomew's Day, 1502. So the university was, as said, opened on October 18th, the feast of St. Luke the Evangelist. The departments were liberal arts, theology, canonical and, or canon and secular law, medicine, poetry, and other arts. The papal confirmation of the foundation of the university was finally given by Pope Julius II in 1507, and Staupitz himself went to Rome to receive that bull in person. But of course, besides the obvious advantages of a university, there were also some issues. A university costs money. There are salaries to be paid and buildings to be built and maintained. At the foundation of the university, there was, uh, there was actually no comprehensive plan regarding the finances. Frederick first permitted the use of the castle and the castle church to the university. In 1507, the castle church became university church and thus was the place for any solemn official acts and served also as a lecture room and as a place for disputations. So the castle church was one of the first multi-purposes rooms, I suppose. The university library was also in the castle. Salaries for the professors were first paid by Frederick directly, except for the professors of theology and canon law. Those professors were either monks from the Franciscan or Dominican monastery in town or canons of the All Saints Collegiate Church. The university was not self-governing, uh, as the older universities were, but there was a council called the Reformers, consisting of four members of the university appointed by Frederick. Frederick also appointed the professors whose salaries he paid. Uh, the professors taken from the collegiate church were appointed by the Senate. The Senate were all the doctors and, and masters together, but the prince, of course, had some input. Uh, what you see here is that, that uh, Frederick tries to minimize the continuing costs. <coughs> So he gets monks, he doesn't have to pay those monks. He gets canons from the collegiate church uh, because there's a, st a steady flow of income from all those congregations that were incorporated in the, in the, um, uh, in, in the chapter of the collegiate church. And of course, this was also one of the reasons why then the Augustinian uh, monks got a foot into university because he didn't have to pay them. A coal once in a while was enough. So it's, I suppose it's a dream of any... Uh, president of a university or a seminary. <laughs> <clears throat> so, what about Luther's influence on university matters? Um, Luther, Luther was, of course, came to Wittenberg because of Staupitz. Staupitz had taught at Wittenberg before. Uh, Luther, uh, Staupitz draw Luther, uh, and uh, Luther became a doctor in 1512. Um, by the way, the university at that time financed itself by immatriculation fees, so at the beginning you paid, uh, also through fees at graduation, but there was no tuition. Ah, no tuition, huh? What a new idea. Uh, there was no tuition, but the costs at graduation were significant. So Luther, of course, could not afford really to become a doctor. Again, he didn't have any money. <laughs> so Staupitz arranged the deal that the, uh, that the elector himself would pay for it. So uh, Staupitz then went to the to the cashier, so to speak, of the, um, of the prince, got 50 guilders, and uh, that paid for uh, all the fees. Uh, there was also some other things, you know, the new doctor had to entertain the entire faculty to a banquet. Um, that was part of uh, the, the celebrations, too. Um, the, uh, the thing that Luther had to promise was, of course, that he would stay there for life and teach. Um, 
So Luther taught, and uh, since 1513, uh, he started lecturing. And in 1518, Spalatin asked in the name of Frederick the most important members of the faculty concerning a reform of the university. It's interesting that Luther suggested first a reform of the Department of Liberal Arts, the propedeutic school, so to speak, the college department of the university. Um, he doesn't start with the theology department, and that is partly because Luther had such an influence among his colleagues that he actually drew his colleagues to his side. The problem was not the other members of the theological department. Nikolaus von Amsdorf, for example, who taught, uh, who started out as a Scotist, was uh, convinced by Luther that he should rather lead, uh, read Augustine than Duns Scotus. Andreas Karlstadt uh, von Bodenstein, um, who was a Thomist, uh, became actually, after some resistance he had put up, one of the most fervent supporters of Luther. So he looked actually at the, uh, the liberal arts program. Again, remember, this is, you first go to the, you first study the liberal arts, get your Bachelor of Arts, and then you go to the higher faculties. By the way, for those of you who teach in the liberal arts department and uh, are unhappy with their salaries, it was the same thing uh, in, uh, in Wittenberg. Um, when Wittenberg was opened, one of the things they did, they were advertising, the cost of living are cheap, eight guilders a year, and you can live in Wittenberg. Okay, eight guilders. So, what did the average teacher at a liberal arts faculty get? 20. What did a doctor of law get? Between 80 and 160. So, the salaries were not quite equal. So, nothing has changed, I suppose. <laughs> so, what did Luther suggest? He wants to abolish, he wants to establish chairs in Greek and Hebrew. He wants to have lectures on Pliny. That's a little strange, maybe. Why Pliny? Because uh, Pliny, of course, wrote the, his natural history. So that would be, so to speak, the science department. And the aim there is get rid of Aristotelian physics, these lectures, and just have Pliny there. Mathematics. And Quintilian, Luther had a very high view of Quintilian. That goes together with his emphasis on rhetoric, the language arts, and abolish the obligatory lectures on the logical textbook by Peter of Spain, the text by the Scotus Petrus Tartaratus, and Aristotle. And thus the required classes were completely redesigned. Aristotle was, though, not completely abolished, but rather now the texts themselves were read without the commentaries. And you see here how Luther kind of takes up the emphasis of the humanists. Don't read the medieval commentaries. Ad fontes, back to the sources. Of course, it's all very fine to establish chairs in Greek and Hebrew, but now one needed professors for Greek and Hebrew. The elector had asked Johannes Reuchlin, one of the foremost German humanists, for counsel regarding candidates for these chairs. Reuchlin recommended his great nephew, Philip Melanchthon. While Luther was undecided, Spalatin opposed Melanchthon, but Frederick the Wise appointed him after he had met him at the Diet of Augsburg in 1518. And thus Melanchthon came to Wittenberg, a true wunderkind, 21 years old, and looking almost like a boy, so that the faculty was a little, well, hesitant. But when he gave his inaugural lecture, the faculty and students were won over and he became one of the most popular and, of course, most influential professors. The next attack on the medieval way of teaching followed the next year when Luther and others petitioned the elector to abolish the Thomistic lectures on the physics of Aristotle and use the time for lectures, of all things, on the metamorphosis, morphoses, I think it should be, by Ovid, and give the salary saved to Melanchthon as a reward for his industry. And so it also actually happened, at least with the abolishment of the, the Thomistic lectures. Because at that time, they had two lectures on everything, a Thomist and a Scotist. Uh, the, the, the Via Moderna, the, uh, the school of uh, William of Ockham, was not represented at that time. Luther was not only active in regard to the liberal arts department. The university was small, and so Luther was also active in writing petitions, for example, the medical department. Thus, in 1522, he signed a petition to Frederick the Wise in regard to the vacant chair of pharmacy uh, to, and asked him to give the position to Heinrich Stackmann, who was already teaching in the liberal arts department, teaching physics, and had a licentiate in medicine. And Heinrich Stackmann got the job, 
He then became a doctor of medicine. So you see here that Luther was very active and a very influential member of the university and that Frederick the Wise did listen to him. So Frederick the Wise is Luther's protector. Well, as we all know, uh, the, the thesis in 1517 started a storm and uh, already in August 1518, the process or the trial against Luther was opened in, um, in Rome. So Leo X wrote to Frederick in 1518 demanding the extradition of Luther. If Frederick refused, electoral Saxony would face the interdict. That means no priest could do anything, no burials, funeral, no, no, uh, well, no celebration of the sacrament, nothing. And also, Leo said, well, if you protect the heretic, then you might also lose your fiefdom. Mm -hmm. You might become an outlaw yourself. And these threats were later repeated. Um, but I didn't put it out in, in, in the uh, manuscript. You all kind of probably are familiar with, the, uh, with the, what happened. Uh, Frederick demanded that Luther would not be tried in Rome, but that he would have got a chance to be heard in Germany. So the meeting with uh, Cardinal Cayetan was arranged in Augsburg, and that was the continued uh, tactics of Frederick. He said, Luther has not been properly tried, therefore I cannot hand him over to you. There was, of course, also the other aspect that, that Frederick really did not want to get rid of his most popular professor. Student numbers had increased, so you really want to hand over the star of your university. Um, but was there also an inner uh, sympathy with Luther's cause? That's, that's the question. Um, the Curia, as said, did not uh, pursue with all might because in the meantime, Maximilian had died. And so there was the election of the new emperor. Uh, there is the whole story about Karl von Miltitz, a minor uh, officer of the Roman Curia who tried to uh, influence uh, Frederick, uh, that came to nothing. On January 9, 1520, finally, the Curia demanded that Frederick should be summoned, um, uh, that Luther should be summoned, interrogated, and declared to be a heretic. When this news came to Wittenberg, the lawyers were asked to write a memo what should be done if Frederick would be banned. Uh, thus, Frederick took upon himself a significant personal risk in protecting Luther. It was not just Luther, it was also those who harbor a heretic. Uh, you, you have to remember that, for example, in the Middle Ages, in the war against the Albigensians uh, in southern France, um, it ended with the Count of Toulouse losing his fiefdom, losing his life. So there was precedent how you deal with a heretical movement by force, and this did not go well for a prince. Um, so the, the, the tactics continue. Luther finally gets banned. What do you do now? Well, Luther appealed to a council. There was a precedent to that too, because the Sorbonne, the university in Paris, had also appealed to a council uh, when it was declared that the Gallican uh, model of church governance in France was uh, illegal by the papal court. So there was still another step. There was, a, in that sense, there was a legal defense. Um, we all know about Worms. It was mentioned today also in the sermon. Uh, Aleander, the papal nuncio, had originally hoped that Frederick could be convinced to extradite Luther. But already at the before the Diet of Worms, he had given up hope. In his letters to Rome, he did not hide his dislike for Frederick. He calls him a basilisk. He says, Frederick looks like a fat marmot with the eyes of a dog, never looking straight at people. <laughs> that bespeaks also the frustration that Aleander had, because in his dealings with Frederick, the issue was that many times when he sought an audience, Frederick got conveniently sick. Ah, oh, so sorry, I can't receive you. Sorry, we can't have a meeting. I'm sick. Uh, so Aleander kind of had it because, of course, after a while he realized that the sickness was always at the moments opportune for Frederick. That Frederick was on Luther's side is also documented in a letter to his brother John during the diet in which he writes about Luther's case it is the work of God, not the work of man. But of course, the fact that Frederick did not hand over Luther to the churchly authorities, but protected him on the Wartburg and later on is the clearest witness 
that Frederick, as reticent and cautious he was uh, not to endorse Luther's teaching publicly in any way, in fact was on Luther's side, even if he might not have agreed with everything that Luther did. And you have to remember what the Edict of Worms said. For this reason, we forbid from this time forward to dare either by words or by deeds to receive, defend, sustain, um, uh, uh, the, said Martin Luther. On the contrary, we want him to be apprehended and punished as a notorious heretic as he deserves to be brought personally before us or to be securely guarded until those who have captured him inform us whereupon we will order the appropriate manner of proceeding against the said Luther. Those who will help in his capture will be rewarded generously for their good work. That was the Edict of Worms. Um, Luther then was, uh, was swept away to the Wartburg Castle, translated the New Testament, wrote, uh, wrote quite a bit, um, and there are two famous letters <laughs> that he wrote on his way back to Wittenberg because of the unrest, and I put them uh, in extenso in the footnotes here because they're, they're deservedly famous. So Luther wrote um, on, in February 22nd to the elector after the unrest in Wittenberg. In Wittenberg, Karlstadt had become the leader, and he pushed reforms. So on Christmas 1521, the first uh, you say Lutheran Mass was celebrated in the castle church. Uh, Karlstadt was a member of the uh, chapter of the collegiate church in German under both kinds uh, without any vestments and also uh, 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 the uh, iconoclasts started to uh, clean out the churches. Now, when Luther writes uh, to the elector, he first congratulates him on the occasion of the acquisition of a new relic a new relic of the true cross. And that's kind of a tongue-in-cheek comment, right? He kind of plays with the elector. He, of course, he knows the elector is fond of relics, even if he has ceased to buy them. And says, well, now you get the real relic. Namely, God has put a cross on you. It is the suffering of the prince that he has now to endure for the gospel. By the way, the suffering he has to endure, not from the Roman Catholics, but from the radical reformers. He encouraged him encourages him to not lose heart in these struggles. The tone is at least at the beginning almost a little facetious with the wordplay on the true cross, um, how Luther takes, uh, takes up the piety of Frederick and gently nudges him away to a true embrace of the Christian's cross. It is though also an eminent pastoral letter in a difficult situation, giving a theological interpretation of the unrest. This unrest has to be Contrary, of course, to what the opponents say, the Roman Catholic opponents say, oh, yes, of course, Satan is loose now, everything, the world is going to hell in a handbasket starting in Wittenberg. Um, Satan is combating the gospel, but Satan is already overcome in the resurrection of Christ. Frederick was alarmed when in this letter, Luther announced that he would return to Wittenberg. And Luther then, wrote, already on the way to Wittenberg, wrote one of his most famous letters to Frederick. The fact was that he disobeyed the wishes of his prince, to him, whom he was deeply indebted. At the same time, Luther was not going to put off what he saw was necessary for the preaching of the gospel. But what about the danger? After all, he was still outlawed. The Edict of Worms stood. Luther rejects any earthly concerns. I have written this so your electoral grace might know that I am going to Wittenberg under a far higher protection than the electors. I have no intention of asking your electoral grace for protection. So Luther says, don't be, st I, I'm not, I'm not playing you. I, I realize you cannot give me protection legally. And then he continues, indeed, I think I shall protect your electoral grace more than you are able to protect me. Now these are very bold words. Luther wants to protect the prince. And if I thought that your electoral grace could and would protect me, I should not go. These are daring words, even words that seem quite mad and insubordinate. After all, in what way could Luther, the outlawed monk, give any protection to a prince of the realm? But Luther did not see his story as a story that could be adequately described in political terms. He saw God in all of this, and thus, trusting that he was doing God's work, Luther, uh, he has no fear. Luther describes himself as minister and evangelist, 
but with his claim that he has received the gospel from Christ himself, is likening himself to St. Paul. Luther goes to Wittenberg to fight the devil who has caused the unrest and the desertion of the gospel in favor of another form of legalistic Christianity expressing itself in the liturgical reforms by Karlstadt. Luther sees clearly the problems that will, cause, that will cause that to Frederick. It is one thing to hide Luther and pretend that Frederick did not know the whereabouts of Luther. It's one, again one of those famous Frederick moments, well, I don't know. And by the way, he didn't. They didn't tell him. He just said, put him somewhere, don't tell me, so I can, with a good conscience, deny that I know where Luther is. Um, so, um, it's another one when Luther, excommunicated, banned, lives openly in one of the electoral residences, so to speak, under the nose of the prince. Luther, in a grandiose disclaimer, indemnifies, so to speak, Frederick from all consequences, encourages him to do his duty as a prince of the realm with no claims by Luther of special protection. Luther is ready to die, but trusts that he is safe in God's protection. But Luther not only assures Frederick that he will not cause any trouble, he again also writes as a fellow Christian, chiding him for his lack of faith. And that's a rather bold statement from a subject to his prince. Luther knows that he is the subject, but in matters spiritual, he certainly takes up a tone that is anything but servile. And uh, this is not in your ha handout, but just to give you uh, the, the continual story, what happened, Luther was banned, of course. What was his legal status? Well, another diet came, the Diet of Nuremberg, 1522-1523, where the papal nuncio, Kiregati, demanded the execution of the Edict of Worms. Uh, Hans von Planitz, who was the ambassador of the Saxon court, uh, had, had told the nuncio that Frederick the Wise had nothing to do with Luther's case. It's kind of an interesting disclaimer. And he also said, an extradition would result in civil unrest. After all, that Luther was in Wittenberg, calmed the waves in the interest of public peace. It was a good thing that Luther was there. Okay? So he's not the revolutionary Luther, actually. That's a good thing. The Saxon strategy was successful, in the diet, uh, was successful because first there was the idea, okay, so who decides about this thing? Well, there was this council, kind of almost like a government, called the Reichsregiment, the government of, of, of the empire, consisting of the emperor or his representative and then 20 representatives of the estates. Um, Planets knew that if it would go to that gremium, uh, they would be hostile. So they steered the course that the entire diet would discuss the thing. And there they were successful because, especially after the papal nuncio brought a message from Pope Hadrian IV, acknowledging that the papal curia had some guilt in all of that. Then the Diet said, well, see, the Pope even says there are all these problems in the church. So right now, you know what? We cannot execute the Edict of Worms. Um, what we have to do is we have to have a free Christian council in Germany that will discuss these issues. In the meantime, uh, Luther should stop writing uh, the censorship in the empire should, uh, should be handed strictly, um, and we'll wait. So actually, that, that diet, 1522 23 gave Frederick and all Lutheran uh, princes some breathing space. Um, that breathing space, uh, again, was done away in the, at the next, at the third uh, diet of Nuremberg, 1524, uh, where the edict uh, was reinstated. Um, it was to be applied as much as possible. That's a nice formulation, as much as possible. And then, of course, after Frederick's death, 1526, at the Diet of Speyer, the Edict of Worms was actually, re, uh, again, revoked in a way, and then reinstated at the next Diet of Speyer, 1529. So it was back and forth. What you see is that there were all these legal maneuvers uh, to give the Reformation a breathing space and to prevent uh, a formal um, resolution by the Diet uh, that demanded some kind of, um, so to speak, uh, imperial execution of the Diet of Worms. That meant war. War came, but much later, uh, in 1545, 1546, uh, 50, uh, 1546 uh, seven. that is the war called war. So, at the time, it was common to dedicate books to patrons in hope that the patron, flattered by the compliment, might give favors to the author. Luther dedicated several books to Frederick the Wise, but not in the hope of raises, positions, or gifts. 
So when his second lectures of the Psalms, the work on the Psalms, the Operationes in Salmos, was successively printed, he dedicated the first fascicle to Frederick the Wise. Luther first rehearses the reasons for dedication. Scholars need protection, since scholars face enmity from the envious and the evil. Others dedicate their works in hopes that the person to whom they dedicate the book will thereby become famous and his name live on, so that future generations will emulate his virtues. Others finally dedicate a book to give thanks for favors received. But so Luther, these are not his reasons. For he knows well the deficiencies of his work. And that's, of course, also a standing topus. When you dedicate something, you say, oh, yes, I'm just nobody. You know, my, this is just a poor thing that I do here. And of course, it's not worthy of you. That's just the, the, the general tone. Um, secondly, Frederick's fame and his love for the sciences is such that a dedication would not increase it. Who does not know that Prince Frederick has become an example to all princes in his fostering of the sciences? In your city, Wittenberg, Greek and Hebrew are taught. See, this is what he emphasizes, which, of course, well, was part of his reform, too. In your, uh, um, the liberal arts are taught better than before. The pure theology of Christ triumphs over the opinions and questions of men, that jibe at the scholastics, which opine or ask almost nothing. All this flourishes under your auspices, on your money, under your protection. Why then is Luther dedicating these lectures, which he only calls labors, not interpretations or commentaries? Because of Frederick's love for Holy Scripture. Luther then tells a story he had heard from Staupitz. In a conversation at court on preaching, Frederick said that the sermons that are based on the acumen of men and the traditions of men are cold, lame, and powerless to convince, because nothing is so ably reasoned that there could be something even more subtle. Only scripture with its majesty and power sounds even without our works in such a way that it overcomes all disputations and forces man to admit that no man has taught like this, that here is the finger of God. He does not teach like the scribes and Pharisees, but as one that has authority. For Luther, this is a saying that would be worthy of the most holy bishop and theologians should take that to heart, especially the different schools of scholastic theologians. When Luther had heard this story, he started to, to love Frederick because Luther cannot help but love those who love the scriptures, just as he cannot help to hate those who pervert and despise the scriptures. We see here how Luther sees Frederick as the benefactor and protector of the new theology, a theology that is based on languages on the language arts and focuses on the interpretation of scripture, not on the scholastic discussions. But Frederick does not only provide the institutional framework in, through the university in Wittenberg, but also his inner attitude is in sympathy with the Sincera the Theologia, as he calls it. And it's kind of not ad fontes, it is ad bibliam. The 14 consolations for those who labor and are burdened. When Frederick returned from the election of Charles V, he became seriously sick, so that there was a fear that he would die. Spalatin urged Luther to write a devotional book for the prince. Luther wrote in Latin, the book was later also translated into German, and even though it was originally intended for the prince alone, it was then later published. In his preface, he justifies his book for two reasons. The prince is a fellow Christian, and thus, as a member of the body of Christ, Luther has a responsibility towards him. It is Christ who suffers in him, since Christ identifies himself with the Christians. But besides the church as the body of Christ, there is also the body politic, of which Frederick is the head. And as such, his suffering is shared by all members of the body politic. We see here that we are far from modern concepts that see the government founded on some kind of contract. Luther has additionally a special debt to Frederick, since Frederick has shown great benevolence towards him. Here we see how Luther describes the different levels by which he and Frederick are tied together. As Christians in the church, as the head of the body politic and one member, and finally as benefactor and recipient. Among these multiple relations, there are two that are hierarchical, one that is not hierarchical. Luther upholds both with delicacy, the equality of all members in the body of Christ and the inequality in the secular realm. Thus, he can address Frederick implicitly as a brother in Christ 
while keeping the social distinctions intact. But it was not always a happy relationship, a happy relationship of harmony, and so I want to talk a little bit about one case where Luther opposed uh, Frederick the Wise, namely the case of the All Saints Collegiate Church. A point of contention during the early 1520s, 20s, it should be not 20, sorry, was the All Saints Collegiate Church. We have seen that this institution was not only important as for, the, for the court as a depository of the collection of relics, but also for the university, since it funded several professorships. Luther wrote already during his stay at the Wartburg to Spalatin concerning his wish that the elector should abolish the collegiate church, call it Beth Aven, the term used by Hosea, as a name of reproach for Bethel. Luther continues to complain to Spalatin on January 2nd, 1523, adding moral accusations. The priests, except for three, that might be Karlstadt, Jonas, and somebody else, um, fornicate every night. Witness to that is Amstorf. And then in the morning they say, Mass, how dare they? Luther reminds Spalatin of the divine judgment for tolerating these sins. Now think what this abomination will merit for the people and the prince. You see here that for Luther, this is not just a theological question. Doing that calls upon the wrath of God. Maybe, so Luther, the gospel has not brought the fruit hoped for because these godless people are not only tolerated, but allowed to deal with divine things. For even though nobody is to be forced to believe anything, public wickedness has to be stopped. Would the prince at least stop the masses which are paid out of his chest? Less than two weeks later, on January 14, 1523, Luther sends another letter to Spalatin in which he urges action in regard to the All Saints Collegiate Church. Here he calls it the idolatry of Amasia, the priest of Bethel who opposed Amos. Since nothing happened, Luther writes to the provost, Justus Jonas, and the canons of the Collegiate Church on March 1st, 1523, after the death of the leader of the party opposing the Reformation, the Dean Lorenz Schlamau, uh, demanding that the canons will abolish the abomination of the mass. There has been enough of a time of transition. If the canons do not abolish the mass, then Luther cannot regard them as fellow Christians anymore. Justus Jonas, Amstorf, and Karlstadt were the minority party favoring reform. On March 2nd, Jonas read Luther's letter to the chapter. Matthäus Beskau, Johann Dölsch, Georg Elner, and Johann Vollmer declared, we can't change anything. After all, we are under the authority of the elector. The elector founded the collegiate church with uh, the stipulations to read masses for the dead. So we cannot make any unilateral decisions. We have to ask the elector. It's actually a reasonable demand. Thus, they sent a copy of Luther's letter to the elector and asked what they should do since the collegiate church was the foundation of the elector and since they themselves in no way thought that the traditional worship of the collegiate church was in any way against the gospel. Again, these are uh, private masses and masses for the dead especially, and of course the continued use of the Roman canon. The elector answered that the masses for the dead and other services funded by his ancestors and himself are celebrated not without justification. There at least we see that uh, Frederick was not on board with some of the ideas that Luther had, uh, had, had taught and preached. Thus, the attempt to change the worship in the castle church did not succeed. Luther continued to press on. He attacked in the Sermon on the Lord's Prayer on Monday, March 9th, telling the congregation that the prayers in monasteries and at the collegiate church are not true prayers. So he kind of ups the ante here. He, wrote, he writes that to, to, to Spalatin, but now he actually goes public and uh, goes public in preaching. In a letter dated maybe March 11, 1523, Luther urges Spalatin that suitable men, that is men who despise the abomination of the mass, will be elected who will, without the prince, reform the liturgical life at the collegiate church. So Luther is now ready to ignore the will of the prince. So he has lost patience with the elector and wants now to push the reform of the collegiate church without him through a change of personnel. In the, sermon on the, uh, in the sermon on the ninth Sunday after Trinity, August 2nd, 1523, Luther makes public that he had admonished the canons twice to give up their papistic abuses and unchristian ceremonies and conform to the gospel. But since they resist, going Matthew 18 on them, he admonishes them publicly this third time. 
Though the canons claim the authority of the prince for their continued worship, Luther asks, but of what concern is to us the command of the prince? The prince is a secular ruler who is to take care of the sword, not the preaching office. They know that they ought to obey God more than men. Also, they cannot truthfully say that they do not understand the issue. Without doubt, there are several among them who understand. And if they lack understanding, why do they avoid our assemblies and do not listen to God's word? I.e., why don't they come to my sermons? <laughs> Luther does not want to use force, but first wants to ask God to enlighten them so that they should abstain from their godless doings. But it is his task as a preacher to not let the congregation be confused by the continued idolatry at the collegiate church. On November 17, 1524, Luther wrote to the chapter complaining that the sacrament was distributed under one kind against what was assured to him before. Since I sense with you that our great patience with which we have borne till now your devilish being and the idolatry in your church, see the conciliatory tone he has here, <laughs> um, does not accomplish anything but that you nourish and strengthen your sacrilege and obstinacy through it, I am forced as a common preacher of this congregation with God's grace to take counsel and means against you. Luther argues that the prince has no issue with them doing what is right. He asked them again to abolish masses, vigils for the dead, and similar things. He asked for a clear answer till next Sunday if they would comply. Members of the collegiate church sent a copy of the letter to Frederick, defending themselves that the occasion of the communion under one kind was a singular event and asking for protection in case that Luther would attack them from the pulpit and cause the people to riot. Frederick answered on November 24th, telling the chapter that he would send Schroff and Pauli to Luther to tell him to abstain from public attacks. But Luther did not heed the words of Frederick, but attacked in his sermon on the first Sunday of Advent, November 27, 1524, the canon of the Mass, and called upon the city council to act against the chapter. He ends his sermon with this appeal. I say that all brothels which God has strictly forbidden, even manslaughter, theft, murder, and adultery, are not as pernicious as this abomination of the papist mass. Therefore, I ask all princes and authorities, mayors, city council, judges, that they would take such cruel blasphemy to heart and call to account those who are responsible for such blasphemy. If it is allowed to you from God to punish a daring knave who blasphemes on the market, then let it be allowed to you to concerning this abominable great anti-Christian blasphemy and take it out of your city, lest the terrible wrath of God may enrage like a fiery furnace over your lacklusterness and punish you with the idolatrous priests most terribly. Love God and honor his honor. Since you have the sword, God will protect you from all princes of devil and also save you from Pharaoh and lead you into the blessed eternal fatherland. Amen. May God's grace strengthen you all times in faith. Amen. After such an appeal, what are you supposed to do if you are the mayor of the city council? Two mayors, ten councilmen, the rector of the university, and the pastor of the city church went to the chapter demanding the canons abolish the masses. Otherwise, they would have no fellowship with them, would not protect them, and start an economic boycott. Thus, the can three of the canons wrote a letter to the prince on December 2nd, telling him that they could not keep their oath and perform their duties they had sworn to, sworn to and asked for directives. Frederick wrote to the city council expressing his dismay about the procedure, but the pressure was in the end successful. On December 24th, a new order of worship was introduced at the collegiate church. We see here how Luther continues to argue and one might say even to agitate against the worship in the collegiate church, even against the wishes of Frederick, even questioning Frederick's authority in this matter. In the end, Luther creates so much public pressure that the prince gives in, though certainly not happily. We see here also Frederick's conservative mindset. For while he did not oppose the reforms in the city of Wittenberg or in his territory in general, neither did he take the opportunity to advance the reformation in the collegiate church, which was, after all, under his direct control. In 1524, Luther wrote a letter to the princes of Saxony on the rebellious spirit. That has to do with Thomas Münzer, who got into trouble with the authorities because he was suspected in inciting the people of Alstedt, where he served as a pastor, to use violence against a shrine with a miraculous image of Mary, which was close to the town. Uh, 
Minza preached against that, uh, denounced it, and what happened was that first a building nearby burned down, uh, then the bell of the chapel was stolen, and finally the chapel with the image itself was torched after everything of value was stolen. Münzer's point was that the Old Testament fight against idolatry is the model for Christians. Münzer even had an opportunity to preach in a service attended by Frederick and John the Steadfast on the duty of the civil authorities to exterminate the ungodly. As we have seen, Luther is not quite the forerunner of the modern concept of religious freedom or religious neutrality of the government. These are, after all, enlightenment values. On the other hand, Luther rejected also the medieval synthesis where the civil government was supposed to not only protect the church, which means the one church, the Roman Catholic Church, but also to deal with doctrinal deviancy identified by the church swiftly and, if necessary, with the death penalty. In this letter, Luther describes the duty of the government in regard to the church. Luther sees Münzer together with the enthusiasts as a part of a wider spiritualist movement. But the issue now is not his, its spiritualism, but its actions. And there Luther repeats to the princes that their duty as a secular ruler entrusted with a sword is to keep peace and punish the rebels. If Münzer and his adherents claim that the spirit leads them, then the spirit must be tested. Regarding the civil authorities, Luther counsels the princes that they should allow the enthusiasts to preach. For there have to be divisions. Let the spirits clash on each other and come to close quarters. If some will be led astray, well, that's what happens in war. Where there is fighting and battle, some will be killed and wounded. But he who fights valiantly will be crowned. But this tolerance is limited. If the enthusiasts or the Lutherans want to do more than fight with words, if they want to use violence, then the princes are to act and exile whoever does not keep the peace. For this is a spiritual struggle, not a physical one. In regard to monasteries and shrines, Luther wants to pull the hearts away from them. Then, once nobody clings to them for religious reasons, the princes might do with them what they want. What, concerns, uh, to, what concern to us is wood and stone if we have the hearts? But what about the claim that the law of Moses demands a, a more hands-on approach to false worship and belief? The Jews in the Old Testament had a certain command from God for the destruction of the altars in the high places. The Christians don't. The difference between Old and New Testament has to be observed. Offenses have to be done away with the word, for mere external destruction does not solve the spiritual problem. Luther asked the princes to keep the peace, hinder any rebellious acts done in the name of God, so that in the religious questions, the battle is fought solely with the word of God. So, in conclusion, there's a temptation to see the Reformation in purely heroic terms. Many a Luther statue follows such an iconographic program, and the Luther at Worms with, Worms with his Here I Stand is the archetype. On our campus in Fort Wayne, we also have the young Luther with the open Bible, that's our joke with St. Louis, right? There the Bible is closed. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but we don't have that much, you know, to claim. Right. Okay. Um, but once, uh, once a German professor visited our campus and he looked at it and he said, ah, yes, the Bismarck Luther. That's not the <laughs> Bismarck, North Dakota, but the Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. The kind of, yes, blood and iron, right? Hero heroic. And of course, that, there's truth to that. The, Luther is a heroic figure. But Frederick the Wise does not fit that heroic image. His image is rather one of stalling, delaying, negotiating when necessary, a slow change. Luther, as much as he was devoted to his prince, was not always agreeing with him, though he was not also not simply the firebrand subsequent times made out of him out to be. Luther did understand that the prince had to gain time, that he did not boldly confess his adherence to the Lutheran cause. But when necessary, as in the case of the All Saints Collegiate Church, Luther was willing to seek the conflict and use tactics bordering on civil disobedience. To see Luther and Frederick the Wise together might help us to see that there is a place not only for the heroic confessing moment, but also for patient diplomacy. But this is not without tension. The confessor will push for clear action because he thinks the time is ripe. The diplomat will hesitate and want to delay. Who is right? Only in retrospect this might become clear. When we look back, we certainly are thankful that Frederick did not pursue an aggressive course of action that might have caused a war in the early 1520s, a war the Lutherans most likely would have lost and might have led to the drowning of the Reformation in the blood of its adherents. Frederick might not be our hero as we commonly understand it, but we owe him thanks, and in that sense, he is our hero. But besides the political role that Frederick played as Luther's protector, 
we should not forget that Frederick provided the institutional foundation not only for Luther's position as a professor of theology, but also gave the university enough freedom to engage in fundamental curricular reforms that reshaped theology. The reform of the church, after all, started as a reform of the university. In an age where higher learning is under increasing financial pressure and seminaries are in perpetual need to justify their existence, the example of Frederick as a patron of learning and theology shines even brighter. In the US American context, there are no princes that will finance theological schools, but dedicated lay people. And following the Oxford Confession and what it says about venerating saints, to take them as an example, I say, may they take Frederick as their example in their love for theology, in their love for Holy Scripture, and in their generosity that makes an educated ministry possible. Thank you very much. We're close to the end of our time, but maybe one question before, yeah. and that would be um, the question, uh, the marriage situation. Um, he never married nobility. Mm -hmm. uh, some say that he, uh, uh, his love was requited, that he had someone that he was thinking about and it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Or, what, or what, what in your mind happened? Did he meet this uh, uh, lower society mm -hmm. person and fell in love with her and therefore he didn't marry? What's your thoughts on that? Um. The short answer is we really don't, don't know. There were, until relatively late, um, uh, uh, projects of marriage, actually. So it's not simply that, that uh, it's not quite the romantic story, you know, prince meets girl from, I don't know, lower social order, falls in love, and so forth. It's not quite the student prince of Heidelberg. But, um, uh, of course, there were also only a, a, a limited, so to speak, limited prospects. <laughs> As, as, as an elector, he could only marry women of a certain class, and it just didn't happen. Um, there, were, there were projects that he could marry somebody from the imperial family, but then the imperial family was looking for somebody better or more powerful. So there were all kinds of things going on, but nothing came, uh, came out of it. Um, and I suppose one reason why then he didn't feel uh, that he really, really, really had to marry was, of course, that in the person of his brother, the succession uh, was guaranteed. You have to remember this was very important, of course. I mean, think of the story of Henry VIII. Um, the, the, the dynasty could only continue if there were heirs. In the case of, uh, of um, uh, John and then uh, uh, his, his children, the line could go on. So he was not under that immediate pressure as Henry VIII, for example, was. Any of our reactors have any, um, uh, the other uh, essayists have any other questions at this point? Dr. Ziegler, Dr. Ziegler, I would just ask if you would want to take a few minutes to expand on the role of Spalatin, um, because he's such the he is the link, it seems, for much of the source material in the letters and so forth that you rely upon. While that's not your assignment, uh, I wonder though if you might talk a little bit more about his character and his uh, his role. Well, Spalatin, after he uh, returned to court. Um, in, uh, when was it, 1515, I think. Um, he became the intermediary. Uh, Spalatin was responsible, he, he was um, not only the father confessor of Frederick, but he, he was also responsible for the educational questions. That's why we have these interactions. And of course, between Luther and Spalatin, there is a friendship that develops him. So again, you have to remember that, that Frederick did not re interact directly, but when Luther writes to Spalatin, of course, Spalatin will with, with some concern. Spalatin will report to the, uh, to the prince, and the prince then will direct uh, Spalatin. So, um, so, so, I mean, without Spalatin, without that connection, of course, there would, we would know almost nothing. And Spalatin, as I said, was also the first biographer, and the only biographer at the time. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, I just wondered, um, I yeah. just add to it a little bit, um, how influ can you comment on the influence of Spalatin? I mean, he's more than just a mouthpiece going back and forth. I'm wondering if that helps us understand the, the Lutheranism, if you will, of Frederick the Wise. Well, Spalatin was won over. I mean, he, he was definitely on Luther's side. 
as we know. I mean, Spalatin, Spalatin was very early on an, an, an adherent of, of Luther. So in that sense, he also made the case not only for the university, but also for Luther to Frederick. Um, uh, and, and without this sympathetic person at the court who, who had direct access to the prince, uh, the Reformation would probably have run very, very differently. I mean, imagine if Spalatin would have detested Luther and it would have tried then to influence Frederick against Luther. Um, I mean, again, this is specul speculative, uh, but uh, Spalatin is definitely also one of the persons that play a, a role in the background uh, but, you know, the Reformation was not just Luther. <laughs> there was a, it was teamwork in a way. Thank you. There may be opportunity for one more question, if there is one. I want you to tell me what wood cutting, wood, wood turning is. Wood turning. Uh, uh, when you, when you uh, put a piece of wood on, on, on a, it, it, it spins and then... And, uh, Lay. A lay, yes. Lay. Yes, yes, that's what you have to do. Okay, very good. So, well, we thank you very much, and um, we will be, we'll recess at this point, and we'll be back here at 2 o'clock for our second essay. Well, thank you again. <laughs>